Let's welcome in our co-host on the program today, New York Times bestselling author, the social assassin, John Gilstrap. Good morning, John. Good morning, Rob. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. I've been working my way through uh, the John Adams uh, thing. It's You can get it on if you have Max, what used to be uh, called HBO something or other. Now it's just called Max. But anyway, uh, seven-part series. I've worked my way through the first six of those. And I'm not going to lie. When George Washington has taken the oath of office as the first president of the United States, I got a little choked up. Yeah, I did. It was, it was kind of, even though it's the actors, you know, it's kind of moving. I that came out a long time ago. I watched yes. it in his first run. I went. Yeah. It was like ten years, maybe. Long time ago. I don't, I don't remember most of it, and I didn't see all of it the first time. I saw a lot of, uh, I think, the first two or three episodes when they were actually discussing independence and breaking from. Uh, England and uh, writing the Constitution and whatever and the relationship and dynamic between Adams and Jefferson and then how it changed as Jefferson became his vice president because back then you were vice was, this was a bad idea from the beginning yes you were the vice president if you finished second so you lost to the guy yeah. already it's not going to be a good relationship what could go wrong <laughs> yeah. but they didn't give the vice president anything to do anyway no and so Adams was, made that painfully clear right when he was George Washington's vice president yeah it was not a barn burner of of a mini series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. It was very historical. I questioned the casting of Paul Giamatti. I can't understand in, half in the things he says. He yes, mumbles them. He does. But it was. It was very. It was. It was interesting. You're more enamored of it than I was. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Our guest in this segment is the Speaker Pro Tem of the West Virginia House of Delegates, Delegate Paul Espinosa. Paul, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, John. Good to be with you this morning. Great to have you as well, sir. Uh, you are back from Charleston. When do you folks return? Is it mid-April, Paul? It is. Uh, we do have April interims. Uh, I'm glancing uh, down at my calendar to see the dates right now. Looks like those are April 14th, 15th, and 16th. And then, of course, May interims. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about May interims, uh, May 19th, 20th, and 21st, because uh, we anticipate uh, that uh, hopefully we're here within the next uh couple weeks or before our May interims in any case, uh, the the question looming over us as far as some of the uh, pandemic funding, and I know there was some discussion of a potential clawback. It looks like almost all but certain that, uh, that we'll be granted a waiver based on the information that the governor's office uh, has provided to uh, the Department of Education, but uh, we anticipate that uh, hopefully we'll be getting a waiver here fairly soon, and uh, uh, I know during the legislative session, as, as I think both of you are aware, we passed a, a relatively skinny budget, even though it was a $4.99 billion uh, general revenue budget. We did uh, defer action on a number of uh, spending items just to, again, uh, proceed cautiously and just make sure that we were in the clear with regard to that waiver before we uh, took on any uh, additional spending. Paul, I know the plan is uh, in May at that interim, and you, uh, I, as I understand it, the governor probably calls a special session for that as well, and you, you do the work on the budget. But uh, why not in the April session? Is that too soon to get an answer on the clawback? You know, it, it, it might be. Uh, you know, again, I think uh, just to, just to uh, th- our expectation is that, you know, May would probably make the most sense there. Uh, uh, just uh, not sure that we'll have everything in place. Uh, of course, everybody, including myself, just trying to catch our breath after the 60-day regular session. So I think the consensus is that May would make uh, a lot more sense. Of course, there's uh, an election uh, between now and then, uh, of course, uh, coming up uh, on May 14th, our primary election. So I know a lot of folks, including myself, out uh, on the campaign trail, you know, uh, meeting folks and engaging in those type of activities. So I think May uh, probably makes the most sense after the dust has settled from our primary election that we can get back into it and address any additional legislation that we need to. Is the governor, governor's office uh, the office that's dealing with the negotiations on this clawback provision? Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that there was a call here recently with the uh, Department of Education and they said that uh, West Virginia was actually ahead of the game as far as providing the information that they needed in order to consider a waiver. And uh, I think the Department of Education was quoted as saying the ball is in their court, i.e. I. the Department of Education. And so uh, all indications are that uh, 
the uh, information that was provided will uh, satisfy the requirements for the waiver. But until we have, uh, you know, a letter in hand uh, granting that waiver, I think uh, I think the prudent thing to do was exactly what we did this session is pass uh, a budget that includes those essential uh, funding priorities uh, while deferring anything additional until after we have that waiver in hand. Paul, I know there is, in regards to any additional income tax cuts, it's an automatic trigger mechanism. Will that trigger happen regardless of what goes on with this clawback provision? Well, it, that is part of state law that in addition to uh, the really uh, record uh, personal income tax reduction that we enacted last session, uh, actually the, the overall uh, budget uh, or a tax relief package that we passed, uh, over $750 million uh, to taxpayers, that includes an automatic trigger. So that is in the legislation uh, as we speak. So really there's no further action that the legislature has to take in order for uh, that trigger to be satisfied. Uh, I can't recall whether I heard uh, uh, Revenue Secretary Larry Pack on your program or, or perhaps uh, somewhere else, but he indicated, and, uh, and again, it's not something that I've really had an opportunity to really look at, uh, but he indicated that if we do uh, have an additional tax, uh, personal income tax reduction this year, it would probably be fairly modest. It can be up to 10%, but it could be really anything between 1% and 10%. Uh, his, his guesstimate, based on what he's seeing right now, and again, I believe that actual calculation will take place after the fiscal year conclude, concludes January or, uh, June 30th, rather. Uh, but he indicated his initial thinking uh, and his team's initial thinking that it would probably be very modest uh, this year. Uh, I was very pleased uh, to support uh, legislation that will eliminate the uh, personal income tax, state personal income tax on Social Security benefits. You'll recall that back in 2019, we did do a three-year phase-out for those uh, couples uh, earning less than $100,000, uh, individuals earning less than $50,000. Well, this year uh, we did pass. We fully anticipate that the governor will sign legislation that will totally eliminate that uh, personal state income tax uh, on Social Security benefits for everyone else that wasn't already covered through the initial legislation that we had acted in 2019. So this year, uh, retroactive to January 1st, uh, assuming the governor signs that legislation, roughly a third of those uh, Social Security benefits would uh, be excluded from personal state income tax. Another roughly a third would be next year and then effective in uh, 2026. Uh, all Social Security benefits would be excluded from state personal income tax. So the three-year phase-out on that. And in regards to the personal income tax, just so that we're all clear and on the same math, so it's anywhere between a 1% and 10% reduction in the current rate. So if the, if the rate, just to do simple math, is 4%, a 10% reduction would take it down four-tenths of a percent to 3.6%. I uh, just want to be clear. So when we say it's a 1% reduction and people think, you know, we're at 4% or oh, then it goes down to 3%. That, that's not the way the math works in this situation. Correct, Paul? Yeah. Each, each year, uh, you're, you're, the trigger makes it uh, possible for up to a 10% reduction. So a 10% of the tax at that point. So that's, uh, that's essentially how that would work. I tell you, the uh, individual who's probably best to discuss that is my my Charleston uh, housemate, uh, Majority Leader Eric Householder, he actually drew up those triggers, so he's probably uh, the most familiar with how those work, so I would recommend next time you have him on the program, he could dive as deep into those triggers as you would like him to. So if you get elected to the Senate and, and he gets elected uh, as, as auditor, do you guys still share the same house, or did this power couple break up now dissolve after this 60-day session, Paul? Well, uh, we've uh, certainly uh, enjoyed uh, sharing... Uh, sharing housing down uh, in Charleston. Uh, we've, we've actually, ever since I've been in the legislature, which is my 12th year, we've shared a townhouse together. We have uh, considered possibly uh, biting the bullet and going ahead and uh, buying uh, something uh, down in Charleston. I don't think either one of us thought that we would be serving <laughs> as long as we have. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think I thought I'd serve maybe a couple terms, uh, uh, delegate householder the same, and uh, I think the townhouse that we 
that we leased down there. We probably could have bought it three times probably by now, but uh, uh, we'll we'll take a close look at that after uh, the election dust settles and uh, decide uh, what makes sense at that point. Mr. Gilstrap. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. I'm going to go back to the $465 million. That's not chump change. Uh, we- was when it seems like it arrived as a surprise. We wake up one morning and the federal government says, "Oh, by the way, you owe us four hundred sixty-five million dollars." Was somebody asleep at a switch somewhere and and didn't do their job properly? I mean, were there hints along the way, as far as you know, that this was a problem? Well, my I, I, I had heard, uh, I'd say probably over the last six months or so, that there was uh, this this question out there, I, I think our, uh, the governor's office and, and others that work very closely with the, with the program, I think perhaps had a little bit more notice, uh, then, um, I think one of the big issues with the program is that, uh, like a lot of the pandemic relief, it, it was pushed out very, very quickly with relatively little guidance. And I think in the case of the funds that, uh, that are in question, uh, currently, my understanding is that the rules continue to change and evolve throughout the process. So uh, I don't think there's any assertion that any of the state uh, education uh, entities, uh, whether it be public education or higher education, I don't think there's any uh, assertion uh, that anyone did anything wrong. It was just a matter of the rules just kept changing. And then it, it um uh, I think the guidance that was released uh, back in 2021 specified that if a state failed to meet certain requirements, then federal officials could seek recovery of funds. Uh, But, again, I think all indications are based on the spending that we have made on public education and higher education, even this year, for example. And, uh, Rob, you'll recall I mentioned uh, during um, uh, – I think it was yesterday, the day before, we actually, even this year, in addition to the state employee pay raise, which extended to our teachers and school service personnel, uh, we also had one of those uh, uh, last year, a pay raise last year. This year, $150 million additional in the school building authority. So I think all those items, you know, uh, weigh favorably on the waiver request that we've had. And so I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, all, all indications are that that will be just fine as far as that issue. But until you have the waiver in hand, you have to uh, uh, proceed cautiously so that you don't get in a situation where you've approved uh, funding in your budget and then have to go back and uh, perhaps uh, remove some of that funding. Also, we tend to th- speak in terms of the great big number. Is it possible that when all settles out, possible, not likely, but is it possible when all when all settles out that we will have to allocate an additional $1 million or $10 million to another educational program just to to qualify or to to, to meet the requirements of the the uh, the COVID money that we were given? It's possible, but I think uh, based on what, what we're led to believe based on our discussions with the governor's office and the governor's office discussions with the Department of Education, it appears that we will have demonstrated that we have more than uh, satisfied the requirements and that uh, at the end of the day, uh, no, no clawback will be necessary. Delegate Paul Espinosa, our guest here on the program. Paul, uh, you were formerly the chair of the Education Committee, and you've served on finance. As the Speaker pro tem, did you find yourself more removed from the nuts and bolts of those committees and uh, getting the work done, or were you able to still get your hands in uh, the mix there and and uh, help create the sausage, so to speak? Well, one of the beauties of serving as uh, House Majority Whip and now as Speaker pro tem is that you know I can still continue to advocate for uh, education reform, of uh, student-centered education. Um, really just as I did uh, when I was House Education Chair, as a member of the House Finance Committee, virtually every major piece of legislation that has a fiscal impact uh, attached to it, uh, uh, that typically comes through finance. So I still get a look at that uh, in finance, uh, you know, just as I would have in, in House Education. 
and I do work very closely with the um, House and Senate education leadership. Uh, this year, for example, I was the lead sponsor of legislation that just uh, enacted some tweaks to the Hope Scholarship Program. Of course, I was very uh, proud to uh, sponsor the initial enabling legislation that created the Hope Scholarship a couple years ago. Uh, while I certainly commend the Treasurer's Office for implementing that program and working through the, um, you know, the various facets of that program uh, to make sure that it was faithful to the legislation, became aware, uh, frankly, uh, through uh, the Treasurer's Office appearances on your program and others, indicating that there were a few little things that needed to be tweaked. So I worked very closely with the Treasurer's Office to craft legislation to address each of those things, and I'd be happy to touch upon a few of them if we have time. Sure. But then I worked with uh, uh, Chairman Ellicott of the House uh, Education Committee. Uh, he actually co-sponsored the legislation with me. Uh, then uh, uh, once it passed out of the House, uh, fairly quickly uh, reached out to not only Senator Grady, who chairs the Senate Education Committee, but Eric Tarr, who... Uh, uh, of course, chairs the Senate uh, Finance Committee. Even though it really did not have a s significant fiscal impact, it did go through finance and uh, was able to get it uh, out of finance with a favorable recommendation, and it uh, did complete legislative actions on the way to the governor. Probably the, the, the aspect of that legislation that uh, I think will, uh, will, will be the most significant change is, uh, of course, the HOPE Scholarship Program, because you have a new uh, class of kindergartners eligible for that program each and every year we are in a we are in a phase of the program where there, there's almost guaranteed to be growth in the program year over year just because you're having an additional class of kindergarten students that are eligible for the hope scholarship well when the hope scholarship board presents their budget each year uh, as required under the enabling legislation, uh, they have to use last year's enrollment figures in order to estimate what their uh, enrollment's going to be for the coming year. And again, when you know that you're going to have a brand new class of students each and every year in some percentage, uh, less than 5% is what it's averaging, but you're still going to have growth in the program, uh, the way that the legislation was initially set up you're, again, you're almost guaranteed to uh, underestimate what the funding that's going to be uh, that's necessary. The legislation that I crafted uh, with the assistance of the Treasurer's Office provides that on December 10th of each year, which obviously is closer to the uh, to the uh, to the upcoming uh, budget year, the uh, charter school or not the charter school, the Hope, Hope Scholarship Board is able to provide an estimate based on everything that they're seeing as far as applications, the number of students that are going to be eligible for the program in the coming year, and just make a much closer estimate to what the actual allocation will need in order to satisfy those scholarships. Without that legislation, it, it essentially could require that both the House and the Senate Finance Committees, when we convene each year, that we pass a supplemental appropriation to cover the difference between last year's enrollment and what, you know, the, the uh, increased number of eligible students results in as far as funding. This just, again, uh, allows that Hope Scholarship Board to make a much closer estimate as to what they actually need. The remainder was just, again, just, just clarifications to, uh, uh, frankly, uh, kind of match what the Hope Scholarship Board was already doing as far as implementation just syncing up the legislation to make very clear how the program is to be implemented. Paul, you got passed HB 5298, which is the bill that prevents a candidate who fails in a, a primary to switch parties and try to run for the same office in the, in the general. What inspired the need for that bill, Paul? Well, uh, uh, frankly, it was a constituent who asked uh, about a situation that we had in Jefferson County, actually, uh, I think uh, during the last election cycle or perhaps back in uh, 2020, where you had an individual who ran unsuccessfully in the primary and, uh, and then uh, ultimately ran again in the general election as the candidate of a relatively uh, 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 unknown 
uh, a third party. There is, uh, in West Virginia, a, a statute uh, that's uh, commonly referred to as the sore losers law that if you lose in the primary, you're not supposed to be able to run again in the general. Well, uh, apparently there was a little bit of a loophole to where if you could manage to get a, uh, a nomination from a, uh, a third party uh, that, that held a convention, you could actually be nominated as their candidate and, and in fact, serve uh, or, or be on the ballot in the general election, even though you lost your primary election. And so this basically just closes that little loophole. John? Hey, Paul, I got a question for you. <clears throat> it kind of tips into the personal, maybe. So I, I hope it's not out of line. I, I don't think it is. You've been in this job now for, for 12 years. You're good at it. You've risen through the leadership. You know, you're, you're, you've, why switch over to the Senate now? Well, it, it really comes down to um, just ready for a new challenge. Uh, you know, I have been honored to serve in the House of Delegates for 12 years in a number of, of key roles. Uh, you know, I think I've demonstrated that I could work collaboratively uh, with uh, really everybody that's involved in the, in the um, uh, legislative process to get things accomplished in, in the House. Uh, I had considered running for the Senate back in 2016 and um, had, had planned to uh, hopefully make that move at that point. Uh, as I, I think I've shared previously, it was only when then Speaker Tim Armstead approached me and informed me that our House Education Chair was going to be resigning her seat, and, and he needed a House Education Chair and asked if I would consider continuing in the House. And after giving that you know, quite a bit of consideration, I, I really came to the conclusion that having a person uh, from the Eastern Panhandle in that position, it, it was really the first time that we'd had somebody you know, in a, uh, a House uh, uh, Education Chairmanship or, or Senate uh, Chairmanship, for that matter, in some time. Uh, I really felt that that uh, made the most sense, was probably the best way that I could continue to serve my constituents uh, here in the Eastern Panhandle. But again, uh, 12 years uh, in the House, uh, uh, a lot of folks uh, actually had reached out and asked me to consider, you know, uh, taking on the Senate seat and just ready for a new challenge. And uh, I, I think really it's a matter of, you know, how do I think I can be most effective at this point uh, in my service? And I think just making sure that we have uh, two senators that could work as part of a team over in the Senate, I feel like that's where I can make the most impact. Very pleased with some of the individuals that have stepped up and are uh, campaigning for my current seat. And I feel like we'll have good representation in the House and that I can be an effective voice in the Senate. Is there going to be a vacuum in, in representation and leadership for the Eastern Panhandle after all the changes next year? Well, I think we have a great uh, group of individuals. Uh, uh, your very own uh, Mike uh, Hornby has al already uh, uh, demonstrated uh, you know, why it's so valuable to have uh, small business persons that uh, are serving in the legislature, because they get it. You know, they have to sign both, both sides of the check, and, uh, and, and that really helps. Uh, I think... Uh, Mike Height, uh, obviously, he's been a great leader so far, and so I think uh, I think it's uh, I think those folks are already stepping up to the plate, and I feel very confident that we'll continue to have good representation not only in the Senate but in the House as well. Paul, before we let you go, uh, Steve Stolifer, the president of the Jefferson County Commission, is up next on the program. Any thoughts in regards to what transpired this week with the two Jefferson County commissioners who were in uh, protest mode? Well, it's all very, very um, unfortunate. I mean, it just, uh, as, as I share on your program, I think back when we were in the throes of this controversy, um, you know, I, I certainly know what it's like to be in the minority, uh, having served my first term in the minority, and sometimes knowing that you don't have the votes to get things accomplished, but you know, I still always showed up for work and uh, just fought the battle and just kept fighting until we had the numbers to obviously accomplish uh, some of the things that we've been able to accomplish today. Uh, and so uh, I think it's very unfortunate. Uh, you know, I know both Jennifer and Tricia uh, actually campaigned with them when they were running for office. And uh, I just think it's very, very unfortunate that um, 
uh, things have transpired the way that they are, but uh, they'll certainly have an opportunity to to uh, plead their case, and uh, hopefully we can uh, get beyond this and get back to some normalcy in Jefferson County government. Paul, thanks so much for your appearance this morning. Very much appreciated, sir. Always appreciate the opportunity, guys. Have a great day. Delegate Paul Espinosa, Speaker Pro Tem in the House of Delegates and a candidate for the Senate seat currently held by Patricia Rucker. They'll uh, go against each other in the upcoming May 14 primary on the Republican side of the ticket.